Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Improving Plastic Part Moldability with Injection Molding Stimulation. Uh, as a part of the Fusion 360 simulation offering, uh, the extension included. My name is Kenny Cornett. I'm a technical marketing manager here at Fusion 360. Uh, I'm joined today by uh, my colleague, Kristen Kilroy. She is the product marketing manager for all things uh, design and manufacturing simulation at Autodesk. So she'll be here to answer some questions in the Q&A panel. Uh, feel free to use that or in the chat. She'll be moderating there as well if you've got any questions as we go along. For our agenda today, we're gonna to do just a brief introduction. You'll learn a little bit about me, and then we're gonna jump into a live demo. This one's a very short webinar, and the demo's got quite a lot packed into it, so we're gonna move very quickly. At the end, we will have an interactive Q&A session that'll last around 10 minutes or so. Uh, just a bit about me. I've been in the design and manufacturing industry for about 18 years, actually, uh, doing all kinds of uh, engineering topics specifically around molded components, injection molding, uh, die casting, things like that. My role here at Autodesk is to focus specifically on deep engineering topics like simulation, injection molding, additive, generative, things like that. So let's jump into the live demo. Again, this is going to be very fast paced. Uh, there's a lot going on with uh, this particular simulation type, and uh, we want to make sure that you see uh, several of the, the important parts here. So here we have Fusion 360 with a consumer product type model, uh, a smoothie maker, a blender. And we want to simulate some of our components to make sure that what we have designed is actually going to be manufacturable. I would like to, to maybe look at this outer housing to start with. And so the first thing that we do is we just jump straight into the simulation environment. We're presented with the study selection screen when we first hop in, and we're just going to pick injection molding simulation. Now, the very first thing that happens is this asks me to specify a target body. So you may be used to a traditional FEA situation where we need to go into the simplify environment and remove uh, extraneous parts of our model. In this case, because the injection molding simulation only works on a single body, uh, we just target that body to start with and everything else is automatically removed from the simulation. So I'll pick my uh, main uh, body of my blender here as my target body, say okay, and everything else is automatically stripped out. So we have this lovely little setup summary dialog box, which allows us to do all of our setup information in one place. Uh, and that includes everything that's required for this simulation type. We don't need to hunt through multiple menus. They're all right here in one place. So our target body, we've already selected. Uh, that's good. Material here. So the materials that are included in a part as a part of the injection molding tool are based on our mold flow database. So there are over 12,000 uh, modeled materials available here. <laughs> this has happened twice today. Uh, it, within that database of materials, though, we've got, uh, again, over 12,000, and they include uh, everything from generic, so you may not be super sure of what you're going to be using, uh, all the way up through very specific name brand uh, applications. Uh, the database also has an awesome search function that we'll look at in just a second, so that we don't have to know tons of information about what we're looking for. We can search for just fragments of a name or fragments of a property and find that but it also has very detailed injection molding uh, information built into it. So we can find things like uh, energy requirements for that particular plastic or viscosity or some of the other more finely uh, you know, tuned details about that material and, and how it might adjust our overall workflow. Um, <clears throat> the materials themselves are not directly editable at this time. Uh, because they are validated by a third-party lab that Autodesk works with. Uh, so again, there are 12, over 12,000 materials. There's really generally not a need uh, to create your own material. And in fact, because we have so many, this gives you a lot of fallback options. If a material becomes unavailable because of supply chain disruption, you'll find another material that's close in properties that you can still uh, obtain and, and simulate that to ensure that your product will meet uh, your specifications on the backside. So 
So we create the injection molding study type. Our body in question is the main body. So let's change our material. This pre-populated to a generic polypropylene, that's probably not a good material for this particular application. Uh, let's go with maybe a ABS-PC blend uh, is, is perhaps what I want to look for. So in this search box, I'm just going to put ABS. And so you'll see that it automatically populates with all results 2001. So there's 2000 ABS variants in here that I can pick from. You can see these generic ones up at the top. Uh, and here's a generic PC ABS. So I'm just going to pick this material as what I'm going to run with, but I could clearly dig in and, and find some other information here. Uh, we have some other ways of viewing this. We can view it as a grid. We also have some quick indicators to tell us about things like energy expenditure required to use a material or what the uh, you know, recyclability or environmental impact of using a particular plastic is. For now, though, we're just going to go with this generic uh, shrieking characteristic PC-ABS blend. So we have picked our body. We have set our material. The injection location is automatically populated for us based on kind of the, the centroid of the part. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of where that's located. That might be difficult to place that in a mold. So I'm going to edit that particular one. I can pick that. I can remove it. And then uh, it automatically sort of prompts me to add the next one. Now, you'll notice that this is not an exact science. This isn't snapping to anything. It's just placing it uh, you know, very loosely on the surface. And that's because at this point, we, we aren't terribly concerned about exact location. This isn't helping us machine a location uh, for a port yet. So this is just to, to get a rough idea of everything. We'll say okay on that. Next, we have aesthetic faces. So this is an important feature here that allows us to distinguish a face between basically A side and B side. A side faces or aesthetic faces can be treated differently so that when the say sink mark calculations are run, we can tell whether or not a, an important surface is going to look bad or feel bad. So I've got tangent chain selected here. So this particular model, you'll see that it's all of these outside surfaces as well as the inside where the, the carafe of the blender uh, goes down inside. But none of these B-side surfaces are populated with this. That looks pretty good to me. This may take just a moment and you'll see it turns it green. So that's a visual indicator to me that I need to be aware of what is considered an aesthetic face versus not an aesthetic face. These next options in this dialog box are process specific. And I'm going to leave them alone for now, but you may speak with your vendor or your manufacturing partner to determine what uh, sort of information you should put in here. These are definitely editable and they will change the outcome of the simulation. And so if we leave them alone for now, they're kind of a good baseline to help us get started. When we look at results in detail, we'll talk about how we can adjust them more and what they actually will do to change the outcome for us. So this is all we've done. There's not any other boundary conditions that need to be applied, like in traditional FEA. Uh, there's no meshing involved uh, on your part. There's no setting voxel size or any of that sort of information. It, it's all done for you behind the scenes. Everything that we've done has happened in this dialog box. So I'm going to go ahead and hit Sol. And what this is going to do is this is going to throw this up on the cloud and solve. You'll notice that there is a cloud credit cost for me. I'm running cloud credits. If you're running tokens, uh, there is a token cost associated as well. If you're on the simulation extension, there is no per study cost. So if you run a lot of these, the simulation extension is definitely the way to go uh, to save money. While this is uploading and running results, I've already done this model uh, in a little different configuration. So we're going to pull it up and take a look at the results there and see what all uh, the simulation has uncovered about this particular model. This may take just a moment to finish uploading to the cloud before I have control back. In the meantime, I will say that you can have multiple studies uh, going at once and multiple components within the same model going at once as well. And hey, Kenny, while you're loading there, um, there was a good, great question that came in. Uh, someone did ask about the actual CAD models. So the CAD models don't necessarily have to be a fusion or, or originate from fusion. 
but all you do is import your third party CAD model into Fusion, and then you can initiate the simulation from there. Yeah, absolutely. They do have to be a solid. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't run meshes at this time. Um, so step, I just sat files, anything from SolidWorks or Katia or any of our AnyCAD workflows all should work just fine so long as they're BREP in nature. So here's this same part. You can see that uh, it, this has multiple injection locations, and we'll talk about why in a moment. Um, but I've already run results on this, so we're going to take a look at these completed results. And I will say that the results on this come back uh, iteratively. So as the simulation calculates the plastic flow through the part during the injection process, you'll get results back, uh, but they're not complete until the very end. And we'll look at complete results first and then go back and look. Time to results on this particular model is a few hours, I think. Uh, there's a lot of factors that go into determining that though. So uh, it's hard to just give you a, a time frame for how fast results come back. I, I do think there is a calculation limit though of 24 hours, if I'm not mistaken. So if you have an exceedingly complex part uh, and it goes too long, it may fail out on you. So in our results view, uh, across the top toolbar here is, is the easiest place to start talking. The first thing is we have guided results, which is the view we're in now. And what these guided results do is they give us information about what went wrong and how we can fix it. So. Our first area here is with fill, and it tells us point blank that this part is not likely uh, to fill, that it will be a short shot. Uh, so 0.35% will not fill at all, 37% unlikely to fill, 17% is difficult, and only about half uh, will easily fill. So if we look through this area where it says next steps, it tells us in detail what's wrong and potential ways to fix it. So we know that there's maybe a pressure or temperature issue involved here because our material appears to be solidifying before it gets into certain areas of the model. So we can see here, this rib at the top has an area that doesn't get material, it does not fill. Uh, in fact, if we turn off all the other areas, it may be even more uh, easy to see. And this other rib here, that's a very large area that's just not filling with plastic at all. So in order to reduce the pressure involved here, maybe we edit or add injection locations. You can see I've done that previously on some of these other ribs and that helped them at least to fill. It, it may not help everything, but it may help fill those ribs. Uh, or maybe the part needs to be thicker so that there's a larger flow area for the plastic to go through. Maybe we just need to add fillets and things so that there's not quite as many restrictions. Uh, or maybe we need to change those process settings uh, like temperature and injection pressure. And so those are things that we would need to talk with our manufacturing partner about in more detail. Uh, some other things that, that we can do uh, with this are just move injection location. So we may not have to add one. We may just need to move it. Again, uh, you know, if, if we're rerunning this simulation over and over again, the extension becomes super handy because then we don't have a per study cost. So we can adjust them all over the place and just run it and run it and run it and determine where a good place to put it is. Next, besides fill, we have visual defects. So because we selected aesthetic faces on this, uh, this will tell us that we've got some areas that have bad sink marks. And there's a couple of ways that we can look at them to determine what's going on. It will also show us weld lines. So if we've got two flow fronts, we've got two injection points that meet somewhere, that plastic will have a weld line in it. And it may be in an aesthetic area and it may uh, present a problem. So these are just estimates of those weld lines. It's not a, you know, a hard and fast analysis of what's happening there, but it should give you an indication of what you need to look out for. Weld lines also occasionally do present as a strength problem because you have those two different flow fronts coming together. So in an area like this, at this corner, that may be of concern that we've got two weld lines. You can see they look kind of like jagged edges through there. So that corner may be subjected to some problematic stress later on because of that weld line. If we look specifically at aesthetic faces, we can see that five of our 87 different faces uh, will have defects on them. So it looks like five will have weld lines. There don't appear to be any sink marks, at least any bad ones, uh, with the, the tolerance that we have set here. But what we can do is we can look at the visualization of this. And what this allows us to do is get sort of a, I wouldn't call it a rendered view, but that's kind of what it is. It, it's allowing us to view these in 
uh, a little more uh, aesthetically understandable way. And what's interesting about this is if you're familiar with standard FEA tools where you can change the, say, displacement scale to be absurd so that you can understand exactly how something's moving or deflecting, we can do the same thing here uh, by making, say, our surface texture very rough and then magnifying our surface defects. We can see that there are a couple uh, through here, which may be of concern. And what's interesting is those are obviously right behind ribs. And so we've had issues with our ribs so far. It also appears they have the potential to create some sink marks if we're not careful with them. So something to keep in mind. Lastly, on the guided results here, we can look at warpage. So the warpage is going to be how much does our part uh, deflect and change once it comes out of the mold and fully cools. So in this case, we've got a warpage of almost a millimeter um, at, at max, which probably isn't great, especially on a part like this where this lip uh, is meant to interface with another part. So it has pulled in uh, quite substantially. You can see the ghosted view of the CAD model versus the sort of rendered view is as calculated. So it's moved pretty substantially. This lip may not fit together with its mating part. It would be important to look at both pieces side by side and determine if if the, the displacement of them both is more or less the same and in the same places, is it still going to fit or am I not going to be able to put this together or not? So that's the guided view. And that sort of gives us information about what we can do to solve the issues that come up. Another view that we can look at though is just the general results. And this is a very granular view of the different study um, results that have been returned out. And so we can look at things like fill animation. So this tells us things like fill time. And you can even see that this has no fill time. It would be infinite. It never makes it up there. Um, but what's interesting is, is we can sort of determine if, if our fill time is too much, if our cycle time is going to be really long, we can find all of that information out on the front end to determine if we need to remodel some things or uh, make changes that will streamline our process further on. So we, we already know the fill confidence is bad uh, for a couple of areas. We can see them in dark gray here. Here's injection pressure. So we can see that by the time the, the plastic gets into these ribs, that injection pressure is basically zero. Uh, so there will be no more material to get up through there. And we'll see when we look at the flow front temperature, for example, that what's happening is the plastic is hardening before it can get up into the rib. So we have to do something to change this geometry to allow plastic to flow into the rib better. Here's shrinkage we can look at as well in this view. Air traps. So again, we see those ribs that are short shot. They just don't fill but there are other places in the model. Now, generally, I'm not too concerned with these unless they're kind of located at a geographic center of a face. Uh, I don't really see that here too much. There are a couple of these, but they're near edges. So our mold technicians may be able to put like a scratch in the mold to act as a vent, uh, just to get rid of that air in those small areas there. Not super concerning on this model in this case. Weld lines. So we've got several weld lines. We talked about the one at this corner or the two at this corner rather. Um, there are several, you can see one here. Right here, this is pretty disconcerting to me actually from this hole where our button is uh, all the way down. There's, there's a pretty wide uh, section through there that looks like it might be okay, but generally that's a pretty rough scenario there with the large weld line from up to bottom through there. So that's an interesting thing to note there. Maybe we need to adjust our fill locations in order to avoid having that particular weld line. Here we can look at the sink mark depth again. We, we checked that out. We can also look at it in this particular view under estimate, which shows us uh, just those sink mark areas uh, and their potential against the, the ghosted model. So again, we were talking about this being behind ribs in this case. We can see that quite clearly. You'll see most of these happen in areas where there is a transition from thick to thin, thick to thin uh, because of the, the difference in cooling rates that does occur. 
And then we can also see our uh, warpage and deflection as well on this model. Now we can also do a comparative view where we can look at uh, different models or different studies uh, or different results within the same study. So in this case, uh, so study one, study one, warpage tolerance versus, um, well, actually we'll do fill animation and fill confidence. So this allows us to see how long does something take to fill and does it fill at all? Or, or are we confident that it will fill? But we can also change this to another study or another, which could be another body entirely. So in this case, I've got my blender top on the left and study three is my blender bottom. And so I want to look at uh, our deflection in both of these models. There it goes. So these two models obviously stack together. So it's nice to look at this side by side and say, okay, they both deflect in the same direction. The, the one on the left here deflects about one millimeter. This one deflects almost two and a half or, or a little over two and a half. So they may not fit together. It may be worth doing a little work on the front end to change this design slightly to either be more forgiving of misalignment or to change the, the way that this fills during process. So that's just one way that we can do that. We also have the ability to do probes uh, for uh, just quick inspection information. Uh, this is great to take screenshots and share with your team, uh, especially for something like the fill animation or rather fill confidence, I guess, um, where we can look at different information. Actually, I, injection pressure may be the best one here um, so that we can see things like the pressure at a specific area in a model. Uh, if the pressure is too low, it may not fill, so on and so forth. There we go. We also have these cutting planes. So a cutting plane would allow us to look uh, inside the model if we've got sort of some complicated geometry uh, to see what's going on inside as well. So we've thrown a lot at you. I'm slightly over on my time before questions. So I definitely want to open this up, though, for some live Q&A if anyone has any questions that we can talk about. Thanks, Kenny. This was a great demo. And as you mentioned, so much to, to squeeze into the short amount of time that we had today. <laughs> um, the one thing I think uh, we're still waiting on a question, so please feel free to go ahead and enter any if, you, if any come to mind. Um, one thing I did want to ask is uh, you mentioned the two different results displays there. Could you switch to that third one just to show the uh, um, injection molding process? Absolutely. So this third option here gives us sort of a holistic view of the entire process, not only the part, but also the machine information as well. So we get information about the time and pressure that's involved and temperature. Uh, and that includes things like the packing time, the cooling time, how much cycle time is really here. And we can take this information even in this table form, which is sort of an Excel uh, style uh, data plot and give this information downstream to manufacturing to help us out. So once we get a part uh, designed in a way that we're comfortable with and simulating well, we can give this information to our manufacturing partner to speed our time to finished part. Uh, they won't spend quite as much time on their end doing the, the sort of hunt and peck uh, trial and error to get all of the process parameters down well. This will give them a, a nice head start on refining that data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I always like that graphic showed on the overview page of that because for someone who might not have much insight into the injection molding process, it really puts it into perspective showing which stage is actually doing specific tasks of it. So we might, you and I might know the, the packing and cooling stages, what it's actually doing in there, but for someone who might not be aware, you could see on that prep, that model of the press, the mold is still closed at that point. We're just letting the material rest. We're trying to get that material cooled down while it's under pressure. And then it's being released and, and able to, uh, to eject from that mold. Okay, so there's been another question that came in. Um, so, this one's referring to the tolerances. Um, so there was that 
ability to look through and specify tolerances within the sync marks result, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and the comment said, it said you had one, but we couldn't see them within the model. So could you go over that again real quickly? Sure. So we want to look at, well, let's go back to the guided result to first to start with. So under visual defects, uh, so five of our aesthetic faces will have weld lines. If we look at all faces though, two faces have sync marks. So let's find the two sync marks. Because we know they're not aesthetic, we know they're on the B side in this case. Looks like there's one there. And there's one there. So they don't look like they're in critical areas necessarily. Um, so they may not be of any real concern. You need to use your, your engineering judgment here to determine whether or not a, a defect is a problem or not. Um, in, in this case, a, a sink mark on the underside uh, of a surface, probably not a big deal, uh, especially one here where it, this is clearly where a, a large wall comes down onto a flat surface. So uh, that's the sort of defect you would expect in that, that general area there. Uh, with that uh, sort of tolerance, we can adjust it up and down uh, from zero uh, to whatever this uh, is here. So that 0 0.1 millimeter, that's not a huge amount, uh, especially on a B side. If it was an aesthetic face that had something like that, I may be concerned though, because that's, you can feel that level of, of defect if you run your hand over it. So, uh, and light would definitely bend off of that or bounce off of that differently. So something to keep in mind there. Great, thanks, Kenny. Um, and I do see a specification on that question. So I think uh, he was referring to the aesthetic faces um, where it, it mentions, or you had mentioned that there was were zero sync marks. Um, mm -hmm. But I think with that visualization tool, you were able to show that, you know, you are seeing that faint wit witness line almost looking thing on the underside of the rib. So those, those sync marks there are able to be, be shown, but take in mind that look at the magnification, magnification setting. He does have it on 10. So realistically, that might not necessarily be any issues on your actual part. Um, if you take it down to one, it's very, very hard to notice any uh, sync marks there. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question. If you do have follow-up questions, please feel free to contact Kenny and I afterwards, and we're more than happy to speak with you about them. Um, I do want to touch base on one other question that came in um, regarding accuracy. So result accuracy within the injection simulation. Um, is there a way to specify an actual machine that you're using, um, or is that more generalized for this type of simulation? So at this stage, this is really meant just as a, I would say a sanity check almost to make sure that what you're doing is in fact generally uh, moldable uh, out the other side. So if you're looking for very specific feedback, mold flow is probably the next best step to take um, and look at uh, the much deeper analysis that's possible within mold flow for that level of information back out. This tool is definitely designed for uh, designers and engineers who just need upfront information about whether or not they're on the right track or not. So this is not a definitive answer by any stretch, but this is meant to provide you with information on the front end to help you get there faster. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Kenny. Appreciate you clarifying that. Um, yeah, so within within the actual fusion space here, it's, it's taking a generalized uh, injection molding machine to use towards these settings. Um, but for that more in depth within like mold flow insight software, for example, you are actually able to choose the which uh, injection molding machine you're using, as well as several other settings that really dig into the specifics behind the process itself. For these, the typical user of something like this, it's uh, that early warning side for it. And I think that's all the questions that we have here today, Kenny. So you can go ahead and wrap things up. Sure. Before we finish up, I just want to make sure everyone is aware of the extension. If you're interested in learning more, you can follow the link on screen there. Um, you know, we do offer a seven day free trial of the extension. So that's no per study cost across all of the fusion simulation types. 
um, definitely worth digging into for more. If you need more information, reach out to us. Uh, you've got that link there. Contact your reseller or your Autodesk partner that you work with, uh, or you can reach out to Kristen and I as well. So we thank you very much for your time today. Uh, again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. We appreciate you very much. Thank you.